So this, the one, three, and the five, like, ring really perfectly. The minor three rings nice and true. kind of basic one one four rings a little bit more truly in tune than than on the 12 tone scales all right here's the sub basses tuned to the how they are on the neck so it's and it is uh, G F down E and then D down, then B, down. Those are the subs on this microtonal 41 EDO minus every other fret harp guitar. This one's really special because it's a microtonal fretboard harp guitar with seven guitar strings and six bass strings. Basically we're using our classical guitar mold but building a steel string instrument. So you can see right here the peg head has, is going to have seven standard um, sealed gear tuners in there which will house uh, seven strings. Okay I'm gonna continue bending here. Looks like we got a little moisture in there. Pretty well moisturized. Pretty, uh, hot temperature happening. Make sure I'm centered up on my bend. Pretty good. Watch this. We've got our this guy, so I'm going to shoot the bottom of this off real well with water. And then here we go. You can see the water coming through really cooking well. That's good. It actually came all the way through the grains and the pores of the mahogany, so that's what we want to see. Okay, here we go again. We're going to do the same thing on this side. Spray it off real well. And then I'm going to make sure these are open. And then this gets pushed down. You see all that water coming through, sizzling up on the edge over here. And this one you want to go a little slower on because it's, it's a pretty tight bend. And that was it. All right, time to take the clamps off. Let's see how well this held the bend. All right, hey, this is Dave Powell here in the studio with my brother. We're gonna voice over the rest of this video here uh, as there will be a lot of time lapse. Um, looks like I'm taking the sides that I just bent out of the mold here and uh, we got a really nice, really nice bend on there. And you're just trying to see how well they held that bend after the heat up and cook. Right, there's always a little bit of like relaxing that happens after you bend the wood and a lot of luthiers like they'll actually over bend it they'll build their molds a little bit smaller so that the bends become tighter so that when you take it out it'll unbend and it'll be about right um, I, I've noticed that as long as you get that waist bend really nice and tight and you can clamp it into the mold as you can see I'm about to do here um, the lower bout can just you know you can just kind of clamp them in they're, they're gonna they're gonna hold their shape even though even though they unbend a little bit yeah but we have kind of over the years decided that we need to thin down the mahogany to a certain thickness so that it is easier bend to bend and it, it's it's more prone to hold that bend the woods definitely bend generally pretty easy as long as you know the parameters that they need like mahogany needs to be uh, thickness down to a certain um, mill spec in order to bend nice and easy but as you can see by that uh, 
clip we showed a little earlier where the, s the water is sprayed on and then it hits that heat blanket and it just steams right up through the grains of the mahogany uh, and pretty much bends real quickly and nicely. I mean, you could see that was not time-lapsed when Dave was bending that and right. he was able to just push that, um, that bout all the way around there about pretty as fast quick. as he could push it. So mm -hmm. um, The upper shoulder, you got to go a little slower. It's a pretty tight bend. Yeah. But yeah. we, we, I think I mill them down to about 80 thousandths on the thickness for the mahogany. Um, that's pretty much side thickness for about all of them. A walnut will be about the same. Rosewood, yeah. you might go a little bit thinner, but rosewood bends really nicely. So you can leave it at that same thickness. Yeah, actually, mahogany is the one that's the most difficult. If you do bend it a little thick, it will fracture on you because yeah. the, the short grains of that thing are, they're so short and... Uh, It'll it definitely. just it's, it has a tendency to unbend more than the other woods for some reason. It's just a fluffier, lighter, lighter wood that uh, yeah. And if you if you grain. if it's too thick and you try to bend it at the same speed as you normally do, it will fracture. So uh, yeah, uh, th this build has been pretty interesting for us. Uh, a few years ago, a gal got a hold of us about doing these microtonal fretboards, and this is actually the first microtonal harp guitar that we've built and it's for the same customer um, well we've done another microtonal harp guitar but not with this specific microtonal fret layout this right is kind of a unique one that's true yeah. it was invented by a guy named kite who is out of portland oregon and i've been in touch with him over the years and he's kind of explained to me his method and his um I don't know what you'd call it. It's a it's a whole system, a tuning system on its own. It has different gauges of strings, different tunings, different intervals. It has different notes, um, and so you'll you'll see a little bit later how how the fret layout is. Yeah, you could one. tell by the intro of this video where Dave was trying to figure out the <laughs> chords of it, and and kind of shows you how some of those chords uh, sound a little bit more in tune uh, than they would on a on a um, equal distant tempered. Um, Fret 12 layout. tone scale right yeah yeah and i you know and i i don't have a problem um experimenting with uh, with tunings and stuff like this when i was first learning guitar i actually started out playing an open g like hawaiian slack key tuning and i actually learned chords in those tunings uh same with open d uh, open c tuning and so uh, my brain kind of is tuned for those to be able to learn some new new chords you know essentially you have to learn some new chords and so that's essentially what's going to happen here on this is I had to learn a little bit about it in order to be able to play anything on it at all. Um, I actually took a lesson from a guy that's uh, really, really good at it. He's kind of a jazz musician named Aaron Wolf out of, I think he's in Portland as well. And he really showed me a lot about it, more, a lot of information. Um, and so I can understand why people want to use this tuning just from the, from your ears perspective, because the benefit that you get out of it is is those major thirds and the flatted sevenths are far more in tune on this scale layout than they would be on a 12 tone scale and i could say more about it but <laughs> i don't know if we need to get that detailed <laughs> yeah. into it this, at this yeah. point so as you can see we're following along this build um this is basically a standard harp guitar build for us other than the fact that the fretboard is unique and then later on you'll see as we're positioning the bridge and and where the saddle lays out um it's a little different to set up the intonation on it but otherwise it's basically one of our standard um harp guitar builds right. uh, we decided to go with a um, a smaller size instrument um this is a steel string harp guitar and normally we would have built it on our s12 mold but we decided to build it on our s12 n mold which is our nylon string harp guitar which happens to be significantly smaller about an uh, inch inch narrower on the lower bout yeah so it's an it's a nice comfortable instrument so this is built for a, a gal and um she probably uh i think decided to go with that because she didn't want uh mm -hmm. the instrument to be too big yeah so uh um, she commissioned two other instruments before this one that are just standard um eight string with the kite fretboard layout so they're just a you know a, a not a harp guitar um and I think I remember her making a comment at one point where she thought one of them was just a little bit too large for her body and she would like it a little bit smaller. And so that's why we went with that nylon size body on this one. <laughs> I was just watching me uh, 
give some hand signals about whether I thought this uh, this joint here was a little it needed a little micro adjustment, and then <laughs> I did a little adjustment to it, and then I gave you the thumbs up. So uh, my little tribute to the Fonz, mm -hmm. and uh, of course the purfling goes in there. Um, but yeah, as you can see, this is basically one of our standard uh, harp guitar builds on the nylon string body, uh, <clears throat> except for the fact that the uh, peg head is a is a um, peg head for steel strings. So and with seven strings on it, so it has an asymmetrical guitar peg head. I think you talked about that earlier. Yeah. But it looks like we got all the spool clamps on there, and now we're taking them back off 24 hours later. Yeah, and I'm noticing our, uh, our attire in this uh, video. Uh, we started this build in the middle of the summer, and um, I can see I'm wearing a tank top and flip-flops, and Dave's got a t-shirt on. And, um, and I'm sporting, of course, the uh, Tone Devil Guitars uh, trucker hat in this scene. Um, and I, as you'll get to the end of this build, I believe we're wearing parkas at some point. Where <laughs> yeah. We're in a different season as the season so. changes. It took us about what it what must be a five-month-long uh, process here. Yeah. We, we actually work on about five or six instruments at the same time, it would seem, and just kind of push them all along every day as we go. But there's always, you know, different things that come up throughout the year. So there's me again, happy with the outcome of um, radius dish sanding this uh, this back. I'm kind of showing yeah. how what I just did on that giant disc sander, which is probably one of the more dangerous tools in the shop. Not that it's dangerous physically, but it's dangerous for the instrument. I've had a couple of real close calls with that thing where... Uh, some tear out. Yeah, some tear the, out. The, the fact that it's a giant disc spinning with a great big old couple horsepower motor, um, and it's that big, it's the size of a coffee table. Um, uh, it'll put, it'll be grabbing the wood from one direction and pushing the wood from the on, on another side of the instrument. Yeah. So you got to really be careful which where you're sanding on that one. Exactly. Yeah. So. Uh, so yeah, a little bit dangerous, but uh, yeah. And then of course, uh, check out our website and order yourself a Tone Devil Guitars trucker hat. So off go those um, office clips, gluing the laser curved lining on, and back to the giant disc sander to be very careful about um, smoothing out that uh, back rim. The lining, yep. Just basically taking the glue off the lining and leveling it back out again. A little bit of hand sanding probably where you <laughs> got to be careful to uh, not catch an edge. <laughs> yeah, so now, and now it it's time like for the back. It's like the back. You must not have videoed the back getting braced, but We'll watch you uh, trim the braces a little bit with your cool little my favorite finger plane, hand plane. Yeah. So the back needs to just sort of get trimmed in a little bit tighter to the rim edge. We usually use a colored pencil to mark the edge. You can see it's kind of a green line around it, and that's the that's the actual rim shape, as opposed to the template line that which we used. So they're not exactly the same as the template. Usually, every time you have to measure the actual rim to see where it's at they're usually pretty close but they're usually pretty close and so here's us gluing the back on and this is this critical moment where we are adjusting the neck angle this is where the the neck angle gets set yeah we set the height of the neck angle which is essentially going to determine how tall the saddle sticks out of the bridge right there when we glue the back on so there's right before you clamp that spot on the neck we sort of use this special fabric ruler that has a little eighth inch gap on the one end and it tells us exactly how high that saddle's gonna stick out and that's where we, uh, then you, one of us kind of holds the neck in that position, the other guy cl clamps the clamp in. Yep, and pretty much sets the neck angle right there. That sets it. And here's a cool tool that we kind of, uh, we, we bought the um, trim router from Stuart McDonald, but we set it up so that we could get the, the depth over that harp arm there. So and that, show, that shows the binding route we just cut using that tool. But we can't get in close enough to the neck because we obviously are doing our Spanish heel construction, so you can't bind all the way around the neck joint. You have to just go up to the neck, and then Tone has to use the little compass router tool there, or the plunge router base for the Dremel tool with a little 16th inch bit to route that last bit up into the neck pocket so that the router bit, so the binding can tuck 
into the neck. And I used to make this little notch channel with a razor blade and, and some chi tiny little micro chisels, but uh, Dave suggested uh, doing this this way, and it has been just a lifesaver, uh, a time saver for sure, um, to get that a real nice, tight, um, tight fitting um, pocket for the binding and a uh, little piece of walnut binding there shows you kind of how it goes in. Yeah, we don't even have to bend the harp arm. The inside harp arm binding is just a straight piece that doesn't get bent. You can see it sticking out there straight. It just bends right into place and don't even need to bend it, pre-bend it. A majority of the time we're using walnut because walnut goes as a nice contrasting wood for most of the top and side sets that we're using. Um, sometimes we'll use walnut for the back and side set, in which case we normally would use some contrasting wood such as maple for that. Um, recently we did a build with a rosewood back and sides and the gentleman purchased a bunch of snake wood and I thought that uh, those woods were so close in tonality to each other that they um, maybe a different choice could have been made on, on that for contrast sake but they do look really cool together. So uh, Yeah that rosewood definitely has like a almost a purple brown look to it and the snake wood is more reddish color. More, more of almost uh, had a little bit of some greens to it too. So, so Tones, do uh, you using the binding tape to get uh, all that walnut binding fastened down? Looks like you don't really have to have a whole lot of tape all around it. I mean, you do have to have it every inch, inch or two. But so here's where the the build di differs quite a bit from all of our normal builds, where Dave's uh, cutting the slots for this um, fingerboard with the uh, microtonal kite fretboard. And, and there are so. a lot more frets on this fretboard, I think. Uh, on a, what, what would normally we'd have 20 frets on our acoustic guitar. This one's going to have, I believe it's 20 up to the halfway point and then another 20. So there's probably 40 frets on here. So you'd cut, cut the dot holes there, which has its own unique mm -hmm. dot hole pattern. Yep. Kind of has a unique dot hole pattern. There's, there's basically f a dot every fourth fret. Oh, okay. So there you have it. It definitely looks unusual from the guitar player's perspective. Yeah, very tight up there. I mean, it's, I mean, it's like mandolin frets almost, it looks like. Right, and that's why you have to go with a longer scale. This and I believe you told me that this was a 40 fret EDO, which is equal distant to the octave, octave it's, spacing. It's, it's 41 EDO. Oh, 41. So technically, the, the way it's laid out is there would actually be 41 frets from the nut to, to the octave, yes. but then this one is skipping every other one. So there's 20 and a half to the octave. So the, where the normally the 12th fret would be the halfway point, this one it's the 20th and a half fret. So it's right between two frets. So there is no 12th harmonic, fret on this there is no, There is no, well, there is a 12th fret, but there's no fret on the, on the halfway harmonic, which I guess would yeah. be the, what do they call that? The, there's an interval for that, I believe. It's the one, o one over one interval or yeah. is it two over one two over one maybe so there isn't a 12th fret on there that there would be an octave well, position but there's no fret there is a fret there is a 12th fret on this instrument there's a tw there's a fret number 12 there's a one through 40 but at oh, the halfway right. point it's the 20th and a half fret uh, okay because yeah. there's 41 per octave divided by two oh so there's not a 12th fret where the 12th fret would normally be that's the best <laughs> It's a little bit off from where the octave is. So you can see me drilling the side dots. I think I just put one dot on the side dots. I don't try to double up any because there is no dot on where the octave would be. You know, there's just one every fourth fret. So I think I just put one dot on every fourth fret. And I believe our customer is perfectly happy with that. But the gentleman that makes these fretboards, he's saying that he would like to have... Uh, he the same layout as on the face of it would be on the side. On the side, yeah, like one dot on the fourth, two dots on the eighth, three dots on the twelfth, and then one dot again on the sixteenth. So that way it actually kind of looks like if you were to draw lines between on the outside dots, it would make a kite. Yeah. The guy's name is Kite. That's kind of his little shtick or whatever. Oh, so it's more of a motif mm -hmm. uh, a logo or a, a, a brand. Kind of, yeah, it's a layout, I guess. Oh, that's, oh so I see how he's got the triangle there. They're oh, kind of triangle kind of or trapezoids or whatever. So it's not Kite necessarily it has to do with the, the musical um, layout of it. It's more to do with the... Yeah, but I, I guess there's a reason. You do, you do want to differentiate, like, 
where you're at on the fretboard. You don't want them just all have single dots because then it's like, well, where are you on the fretboard? You know, if you, if you have a, a double and a triple, it kind of oh. tells you where you're at, you know. There's already too many frets, so having a little <laughs> bit of alignment markers is going to be in your benefit. Yeah. So all Tone has to do now basically is just glue that fretboard on there and then you know just like we normally would glue a fretboard on the same way but when i set the bridge i'm going to have to you know basically measure from the nut to find the bridge position usually we kind of measure from the 12th fret which would be the octave and we have a little tool that sets right on that 12th fret measures to the nut and then we flip it over and then it tells you right where the bridge position would be um and we'll i'll tell a little bit more about that when we get closer to gluing the bridge on but in this case, we don't have a 12th fret. We don't have an octave fret, I should call it. There is a 12th fret, but there's not an octave fret. There you go. That's a better nomenclature. So there you are taking the tape off. Got to be careful not to tear up any grain on the cedar. The tape oh. will tend to uh, pull up some grains every now and again. And with, this is a steel string harp guitar, and normally we would probably use Engelmann spruce, uh, but... Western Red Cedar is also a great alternative for a steel string instrument. It provides a real beautiful overtone, rich um, top um, resonance. And so um, I, I always love playing either a nylon or a steel string guitar with that Western Red Cedar. Oh, yeah. But her other two <coughs> instruments were also cedar tops. And, and she wants to play these three instruments together um, and have people learn this temperament, this layout, and play she, some particular compositions for this yes she's kind of composing for it and she wants to people to learn it with her and then um have them play together and then that way they'll have the same kind of tone well i sure hope that we can hear some music played on these instruments it's been a a challenge to say the least um designing and creating them um actually i mean we got to hand it to the uh, inventor of this uh, microtonal system as well of course but um it's just, it's a, I mean, when you're all done with this instrument, normally we build a harp guitar, we can play the thing and, you know, enjoy what we've created um, usually. But this one is a little bit of a challenge because you get done with it and you're kind of like, you feel like you're a brand new beginner guitar player. You don't yeah. even know anything about what, what's going on with the musical layout of it. So it's like relearning the, relearning everything. So um, it's a new tuning and a yeah new set of strings, new chords. What I should do is, is show people there's a way with just a regular standard 12-step guitar to, to show them what the difference is with a perfect in tune flatted 7th and then a equal temperament flatted 7th. And yeah. you can hear the difference in how far out of tune they are. And it's really our ears that are um, th that hear things out of tune. And we're so used to hearing them out of tune that when we hear it in tune, it sounds bad. But it's not that it's bad, it's that your ear is not used to it. And yeah. so you have to condition yourself to, to hear it that way. Or recondition yourself to understand what perfect intonation would be. And yes. I, I mean, you, if you get down to the education system of, of music, jazz theory, jazz music theory, and modern music theory is based on the idea that these equal temperament um, tunings, these in, equal temperament intervals, are the way they are. In other words, the the set the seventh the flatted seventh note of the scale is what were you saying? It's about thirty cents sharp. Sharp. So yes. that that it, being that way, it 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 sounds like it wants to resolve when you when you play yeah. a flatted seventh chord. It sort of changes it really the is, voice. Is is designed to push that uh, chord into another chord. In other words, it's trying to resolve to the one or the five or whatever uh, your um, Usually composition the, the is going for. Usually, the sevenths want to resolve. Because that seventh is part of the five chord, it wants to resolve back to one. Yeah, of course, and it's a seventh, so it wants to go to the eighth, which is the one. So, um, but when you hear a perfectly in tune flatted seventh chord, like for instance on this instrument, or if you were to take a six string guitar and tune one of the strings down that down a little cents, bit, that yeah. thirty cents, and play that seventh chord, that you know, a, add a, the flatted a, seventh up on that note, you, you actually are like, wow. I mean, it almost feels like this chord is resolved all on its own. So um, the theory behind this, th this interval tuning is very interesting. 
uh, to me, and it makes me think about people playing uh, non-fretted instruments, in other words, bowed strings, how they can naturally do that. They can naturally right. play those notes in the um, correct interval um, that is more in tune to your ear. Yeah, if you guys want to research some of that, you can just kind of look up uh, the different temperaments that are out there. And there's, for guitar, there's, you know, dozens and dozens, if not more. Um, there's a lot of great YouTube videos out there where people show you about the uh, temperaments. Yeah, and you can, like, really play in D, D major. I can't remember what it's called. It's like D, D modal one temperament or something. And, and it just, everything in D sounds awesome. But as soon as you play... You know, right. like B major, it's it's completely out of tune. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of theory behind what's going on behind all of this stuff. And so he came up with this layout to kind of be able to do everything on the one fretboard. You can get all of those temperaments without having to change tunings and change strings and change the fret or positions. You can get a lot of them, in other words. You can get a lot not of them. Not all but of them, but a lot. The problem is, is that you have a lot of in-between notes that are in there that are not as useful, and you have to know which ones those are and skip them. Yeah, so they in really other words, work. if you're playing any chord on the, on the frets, any of the open notes are probably not going to work. Probably not going to so work with that. Temperament. That's one of the frustrations that you get when you when you play one of these guitars f right out of the gate, um, is that y y you try to play a even if you get a, a fingering where some of the notes under your fingers are in tune with each other and are the proper intervals. If you try to pluck any of the yeah, open, open ringing note, strings, yeah. uh, chances are they're going to be out of tune. They will be dissonant with it. Yes. But Cindy sort of came up with the harp string tuning that she wanted on this particular instrument. And so she told me which notes those were. Um, I'm assuming for the certain keys of the songs that she's playing uh, that she wants it for. And maybe some of them are going to be, you know, sort of a catch-all tuning. Maybe it's going to be a catch-all tuning, so they'll work in multiple different keys. I'm not sure. Um, so it, it's nice to have artists that are you know able to kind of tell us and instruct us in that method but that was definitely a conversation i had to have with her what, what am i going to tune these harp strings to and then i had to calculate the gauges to get for them to get right. those notes and they were definitely higher they were this is a higher tuning than our standard s12 model instrument you mean the harp strings the sub bass strings sub bass strings are, are, are more higher. more like what we would call the bennett tuning which is a re-entrant re tuning where some of the notes on the harp are actually higher than the lowest notes on the neck yeah the first note of the of the harp is a g which is like the third fret on the low e string of the guitar so it's kind of a re-entrant and that actually is right about where this one starts i believe is at that g mm -hmm. and then just descends diatonically instead where bennett goes down a fifth or a fourth below that goes from g down to d where on this one it just goes almost diatonically. I shouldn't say that because it's, it's microtonally down from <laughs> Mic there. Microtonally, yeah. Uh, whole steps or something, however they had it. D G, F sharp, E down or whatever. But uh, looks like I'm getting the first coat of the water-based polyurethane sprayed on. Checking it that it got a nice even coat. And there's no runs or anything. Uh, I've got my gun dialed in pretty pretty well these days so that it just puts a nice wet look on it and that's how i know it's just done with that coat it's better to do thinner coats more often more multiple thinner coats than it is to try to build it up faster i think here you're going to see me wreck or bulldoze right into the oh it's jig. in the background right there you can see the first one you did it's right in the background on the upper oh, left okay. hand corner. i had to i had to i had to cut this bridge twice because the first one got a misalignment and uh, I ended up cutting into the melamine. You can see on the bottom right of the, or the top right of the melamine there, there's a corner. So this has seven strings on the guitar and six on the sub bass side of the bridge there. Seven guitars, six sub basses, yes. So we call this the OMS 13 MT for microtonal. So yeah. the, an OMS, like an orchestra model symphony uh, range part guitar with 13 strings, OMS 13. As you can see, I'm wearing my parka now, so it's close. It must be wintertime. Must, must be some snow outside. So Actually, it's not even quite winter. We're recording this today on December 14th, so we have about two feet of snow out right now, but it's still not winter yet. In Sandpoint, Idaho, <laughs> where we hail from. We did get a cold fall this year. 
So as you can see in the video right now, I am fitting the bridge to the top of the instrument and I've used my little uh, belt sander that I've got set up just for doing that radius underneath there. So I've got that uh, central machinery tool right. set up for just that one job and now I'm doing the final shaping, scalloping and mm -hmm. uh, thicknessing to this bridge and, and uh, giving it a little fine sanding. Yep. Yep, that's pretty and, good. Uh, and it's then, getting uh, pretty close. It was at least nice to do this build. Uh, the, the last few builds we've been doing have had a lot of strings on them, uh, more than the usual 12, 12 or 13. <laughs> um, and a half. They have super like trebles on them quite a bit, and this one didn't have that, so at least it was just a standard harp guitar with the, without the trebles. Without the yeah. super treble strings. So would have added a whole other angle of challenge to this build. So looks like I'm Anyways, this is talking here. But I was going to check the other 16th on the side of that hole. So I'm measuring the left and right placement. That's it. Mm -hmm. so Sounds like, like you figured out the intonation. Yeah, I had to measure it, it from the nut, like we were talking before. You have to measure the t the scale length is twenty six and a half inches, I believe. So normally you set the intonation by um, measuring from the twelfth from fret. the twelfth fret yeah. up there, but this one doesn't have a fret at the, the octave, octave fret, position, yeah. so it uh, it requires a little bit more uh, fine tuning on there. But um, anyway, so the bridge is set and placed, and now I etch the varnish off there, so it's a good wood to wood glue joint. And I always like to take my uh, little scraper tool, uh, which is actually a little hacksaw blade of some kind. Rough up both and ends, rough both up surfaces. both wood surfaces to really allow that glue to penetrate. Because that final brace, the bridge, is uh, one that you just want to have the best joint possible, so that you never get that thing to um, come loose on you or pop off. Yep. So, uh, and then a lot of extra cleanup goes into that because you want you plenty of glue. You want a lot of glue, and you really don't want to have any glue left over after it's dried because it's really hard to get off of there without dinging the surface. Yeah, yeah, this western red cedar is very soft. So looks like Dave's got some got tuners, tuners installing. On. Yep, yep. Get just regular guitar seal gear tuners. Um, I used to just exclusively buy Goto tuners, and now I kind of get the, the cheaper versions on uh, like WD Music sells a decent uh, sealed gear tuner they're basically the same thing i mean it's it's the same tuner essentially right but they just don't have the name brand so they seem to work the same and and last the same length of time so i have to cut a custom saddle oh yeah of because course. it's a seven string guitar uh, i can't remember i think i just used our standard tusk stuff All right, well, thank you guys so much for watching this video. Um, we have a lot of fun producing these videos and building the instruments, of course. Uh, go ahead and subscribe to our channel if you feel like we've earned it, and uh, leave a comment down below. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for tuning in, guys, and let's hear what it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> let's play some guitar chords. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were doing a better job than me, Dave. What are the bass strings tuned to? They're tuned to G, F down, E, D, C down, and B down. So this, but this F down is not the same as this F double down on the guitar neck. So you got these, that's how they're supposed to be. This one's an F, double up and this is an F down. Actually this is if that's an F down then this needs to be right there. And this is an F double up so so it's 
kind of like a G, F sharp, E, D, C, B. But. What's the tuning of the guitar? The tuning of the guitar is E up, oops, E up, C up, C double up, A down, F, C sharp, A up, and F double up. Hmm. So it's like an, like an F sharp, I guess. But I think it's a little bit sharper than that. All right, thanks guys for tuning in. Uh, you can check the description below for a link to the Kite Guitar website for more information.